Good. That's good singing, good music. <laughs> Don't know what you've been listening to this week, but it doesn't get any better than what we've heard this morning. Amen. <laughs> Amen. You have your Bible, turn to the book of Hebrews chapter 1 with me this morning, please. Verse 1. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. We open the infallible Word of God, folks. If it's the Word of God, it's got to be infallible, right? Amen. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter number 1 and verse 1. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by His Son, whom He hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also He made the worlds who being the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person and upholding all things by the word of His power, when He had by Himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the Majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, as He hath by an inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For to which of the angels said He at any time, Thou art my Son, this day have I begotten Thee? And again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, And let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels he saith, Who maketh his angels spirits, and his ministers a flame of fire. Now look at verse 8 carefully. But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever a scepter of righteousness, is the scepter of thy kingdom. Father, bless your holy word now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You can be seated. Sometimes the Bible will take you back into a time, into a place that is hardly comprehensible. The human mind has a hard time uh, wrapping itself around some things. And of course, the essence and nature of God is one of them. The Bible said here there was a time when God said to the Son, O oh God. And it blows your mind to begin to think that that almighty eternal being would look at someone and call him God. But when you understand the fact that we have Father, Son, and Holy Ghost that make up the Godhead, in other words, that is the essence of God manifested as Father and as Son and as Holy Ghost. I personally believe that God Almighty the Father as an eternal invisible spirit being that no creature has ever laid eyes upon, and that it is a privilege beyond imagination for a creature to be able to see this being that I'm talking about. In order for us to understand him in a small way, he must come forth from that place that he resides in and make himself known to us as the Son. The more that we comprehend the Son, the more we begin to understand the Father. No man knows the Father but the Son. No man knows the Son but the Father. The Lord Jesus Christ, among the many things that He came into this world to do, is to bring us to the Father, is to begin to give to us that ability to comprehend when the time is right, God Almighty in His essence as Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. The way we are this morning in this fleshly body, you don't even want to think about being brought into the presence of Almighty God. You don't even want to think about it because there's no way that you could even stand there. Number two, your physical body is incapable of comprehending Him because it has no concept of the greatness and majesty of Almighty God. It's, a, it's our fault that we always try to bring Him down to our level and try to explain His greatness, His majesty, His eternity by human terms, and they always fail. God is greater than your mind could ever think. He's beyond your greatest reach. He's deeper than ever thought that you've ever had in your soul. You came forth from Him. He is not a creation of your mind. Therefore, the human mind cannot get a hold of who God is. But can you imagine the time when that absolute almighty being looked to one next to him and called him God? And that's what you're getting a hold of in the book of Hebrews chapter number one. It is that manifestation of the Lord Jesus Christ, the God man, that God the Father said, Thou art God. 
And so the Lord Jesus Christ, in every sense of the word, in every way that you could comprehend him, and in every way possible that a human being could define the term, he's God. Yes. There's only one God, just one God. And so, my friend, from this day to the last breath I ever draw in my body, I will worship the Lord Jesus Christ as that almighty, eternal being that is from everlasting to everlasting. And above him there is none other. His name is above every name. And at the name of Jesus, every knee is going to bow. And he can save your soul. At his word, the dead come forth. He walks on water. My friend, he can heal the sick, cast out devils. And by his word, he creates universes. He's God. And so the Lord Jesus Christ begins here in the book of Hebrews, chapter number one. He does not mince words. He lays it out as plainly as he can. He compares him with angels. He compares him with Moses. He compares him with Melchizedek. He compares and compares and compares. And the comparisons fail, for there is none like him. He's above them all. Hallelujah to God. If a man calls himself a Christian and doesn't believe that, my friend, you're far from a Christian. You believe in some made-up God, some creation of the human mind, something that some religion will accept apart from Christ. Listen, folks, for what you believe about the Lord Jesus Christ, if you are a true born-again believer, what you believe about him will separate you from every religion on the face of this earth. You cannot walk together. You cannot be agreed. Christ is all. Or he's nothing at all. Amen. So Hebrews starts out with that kind of terminology. Chapter number 2 and verse number 3 says this. Hebrews 2 verse 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? People today make money, they make sport, and they make pleasure. They make everything under the sun except thinking about their eternal soul. So what would it profit you, my dear friend? You've got it all. You gain the world. But the Lord said, what would it profit you to gain this world and lose your soul? The salvation of your soul is the most important thing in your life. To know, to know the Lord Jesus Christ rightly, there's nothing greater than that. That's the only thing that can make you free. He can break the bonds of sin, tie down the chains, and give you life. But the Lord Jesus is the only one that can do that. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. At the name of Jesus, demons run. At the name of Jesus, angels stand at attention. The spirit world knows its place. But a man is like a cow. He wanders around and chews his good. Like a dumb animal. And been made higher than all the other animals. All other creation. Do you realize what God made a man? He made him higher than an angel? Not now, but he will be. Do you realize that the Bible says nowhere that a cherubim or a seraphim or an archangel, Gabriel, Michael, or anything is made in the image of God, but he made you in the image of God. That means God had a special place for us, and he does. This salvation we're talking about not only saves your soul here and now, but it saves you for eternity. And one day you'll bear the image of the Almighty, complete and perfect. Hallelujah to God. And when I see the seraphim fly by crying, holy, 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 I see them are at the archangels and the angels and all the rest of the created world as they take their place. I will stand among the redeemed. None of them came from the pit, but I did. None of them have been saved, but I have. None of them will bear the image of God, but I will. I'll have a special place because of his love for me. You neglect that salvation. What lies for you, folks? What lies outside of God? What does the future hold if you don't know the Lord? There's nothing out there but darkness. What hold, What's the future hold for me, preacher, if I don't know the Lord? Sal no salvation, separation, damnation, eternal damnation, and hell fire. You don't want that. You don't want that. And ultimately, the lake of fire. You sure don't want that. Any man is right in mind, if I gathered all of humanity and there's a lake of fire and standing before them, and every one of Adam's race that ever lived stood on the banks of the lake of fire. And I looked at you and I said, you've got a choice now, the lake of fire or Christ who died on the cross. Yeah. Why, well, you'd say, well, that's no choice to make. A man be a fool to reject Christ. Why, well, I'm, I'm a screaming idiot if I didn't accept him. I don't want to go to the lake of fire. And so they'd all say, give me Christ. And folks, it's that simple right now. 
It's either Christ or nothing. Not Christ plus anything or Christ minus anything. It's the Lord Jesus is all. To have him is to have life eternal. Hebrews chapter number 2 and verse number 9 says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. That's a peculiar term. How in the world can somebody taste death? You die or you live. The Bible said appointed a man wants to die and then the judgment. We all know that there's coming a time the Lord doesn't come back soon. We know that we will go, as David said, the way of all the earth. We know our time will come. We know that. That's inevitable. That's coming. We don't know the day. It's a good thing we don't. Some things God holds back from us, I'm glad he does. I don't want to know every tick of every clock. I don't want to know every detail of everything. I don't want to know some of this stuff. I like to live, my friend, a trusting God with my life. But the Bible said he tasted death, that he should taste death. What do you mean by that, preacher? He tasted your death. He tasted my death. He tasted the death of the murderer when he comes to the end of his life and his victims fly before his face. His conscience eats his soul and he realizes he's going off into eternal damnation because he's a murderer. He tasted the death of the rapist as he comes down to the end of his way. And all of those victims come flashing before his soul. And forever he carries them down into damnation. He tasted that death. He tasted the death of the pervert who's lived out his days, now dying of age or something else of that nature. And he's at the end of his way and all of the good talk, all of the spin means nothing when it comes time to die. He tasted that death. He tasted that death. In plain words, he took in himself death and all of that he could offer. He drunk the dregs to his bottom. The Lord Jesus Christ tasted your death. I'm glad he took mine because I don't have to taste it now. I'm glad he tasted my death. I don't have to taste it. I'm glad, thank God, I get to die the death of the righteous. Hallelujah. The Bible said, blessed in the sight of the Lord are the death of his saints. Hallelujah. Well, the church has to make me a saint. I don't fail every day. The church had nothing to do with making you a saint. God made you a saint the moment he saved you. Saint has nothing to do with halos around your head and being set aside and this and that. Saint has to do that you belong to the Lord. You've been washed in the blood and the Holy Ghost permeates your soul. <laughs> I'm glad he tasted my death because I was on the way to that death. I was on the way to eternal death and damnation. My friend, the Bible says in the book of Hebrews, chapter number 3, and verse number 12. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. For just a moment, imagine in your heart, standing at the, gro at the great white throne judgment, standing at the judgment before God. You can't offer any defense. There's not a word you can say on your behalf. And there's one standing next to you that never heard anything that you've heard. You heard it, and you had an evil heart of unbelief. What is an evil heart of unbelief? What is that preacher? You've come to church, you hear the preaching of the Word of God, and you, oh, hum, you know, i got more important things to do out the door. You go, forget about it. You don't care about carry on with your life, no big deal. Everybody's a Christian in Tennessee, blah, blah, blah. You live like that. You've lived like that for decades. But then somewhere down the line, the light comes on inside your soul. Conviction comes to you. For the first time in your life, you realize you are something altogether different than you ever thought you were. It's not what men say you are. It's who God says you are. It brings you to conviction, and you get saved. Well, then you didn't have an evil heart of unbelief. What's an evil heart of unbelief? It's a heart that's heard the truth, considered the truth, and rejected the truth and walked away from the light and said no to the light and refused the grace of God. An evil heart of unbelief is a heart that has the opportunity that many don't have and says no to God. That's an evil heart of unbelief. You say, well, I've rejected Christ. I rejected him a lot of times before I got saved. I don't know how many times I rejected him. I couldn't keep count of it. I couldn't write it down. Nobody knows that. 
I remember when I was a boy, I'd hear the altar call, I'd think about eternity, I'd think about hell. It bothered me. I was bothered by it. I allowed my mind to be carried off into eternity and I thought, my goodness gracious, if I go to that place, I'll be there forever. That's what bothered me. But in 1973, when I was 27 years old, something came out of the clear blue. It came down upon my soul. It got my attention like it never had been before. I came under real conviction. This time I could feel hell. This time I knew I was a sinner. This time I had made no more excuses and I wasn't ready to run from God. I was running to him. So I didn't have an evil heart of unbelief, thank God. You say, preacher, there's always hope. I hope there is always hope. But we can't prove it from Scripture. For sometimes the day of grace is gone. And this is what he's warning you about here. Don't pass it off lightly. Lest there be found in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. God's long-suffering. He's merciful. He's gracious. He waits for us. He'll put up with more garbage out of you than you could ever, that you'd ever put up with anybody. He'll let you treat him like a dog. Talk about him like a dog. He'll let you put him on, take him off, hang him up. He'll let you do him all kinds of ways because he loves you and he's long suffering. But there's a time you hang him up the last time. And there's a time you say no to him the last time. And there's a time you cross a line that you can't cross back over. There's a time that that heart, which is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, who can know it? Satan will always play with your conscience and your heart and say, it's okay, it's okay, you've got a little more time. Listen, get what you can out of life, enjoy sin's pleasures, and just have yourself, it's going to be okay, it's okay, it's okay. Because God is a loving God, He's a merciful God, He's gracious. And when you get ready after you've drunk to the full, after you've enjoyed sex, everything this earth has to offer, then you can ask God to save you. And it'll be okay. That's not the Holy Ghost telling you that. No, 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 no. Because the thing about the heart, heart is that it gets harder and harder and harder. An evil heart of unbelief. Oh boy. It's hard to find it in kids today. A teenager would be hard to find an evil heart of unbelief. A young person, 15, 16, 17, 18 years old. But I'm going to tell you right now as we approach this end time and the powers of darkness that have been unloaded on us, it's turning people into monsters. It's turning kids into monsters. One killed one the other day, just not too long ago, just a, just a few days ago, 17 years old. Why did they kill them? They wanted to watch them die. They just wanted to get the feeling. 17 years old, wanted to feel what it was like to kill somebody. That's somebody jaded. That's somebody that's been filled with the Spirit. That's somebody that's played all the games, done all the stuff. Their emotions have been excited. They've, they've tried everything. And now they're bored to death. And so now they're ready to kill somebody so, to, so they can find out what it feels like. In some countries, they'd find out what it would feel like to be executed too. In the book of Hebrews, chapter number 4 and verse 8. Now watch this. Hebrews 4, 8. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? There, there, there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. Rest. 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 You know what drives you at nine on Friday night? You know why you got to run? You know why you got to get on that dance floor? You know why you got to drink? You know why you got to bed hop? You know why you got to do all this stuff? Something's driving you. There's no rest. You're not enjoying life. You're not alive. You're not living. You're dying. Because more and more and more of your soul dies. You're driven. And that's the way people are. There's no rest, the Bible said, saith my God to the wicked. There's the troubled sea as it cast its waves upon the earth and the foam builds up. That's the way the human heart is that has no rest from God. I live a boring life. I'm very boring. I just have to tell you, I bore you to death. I read, and pray, and sometimes I sit out and look at the woods and watch the squirrels jump and the rabbits and the raccoons and 
drive on the countryside and look over to cattle graze in the field and I think, I wonder what grass tastes like. <laughs> I mean, after all, they got the biggest spread of food ever anybody does. <laughs> Wouldn't it be something you could eat grass? Good night. Just go out and have a bite <laughs> wherever you are. Eat cheap. When I look at things, I watch a hawk as it soars in the sky. Every once in a while, you'll see an eagle. You go over to Clinton, that river that runs down through there. What's that river over at Clinch? Go to the Clinch River in Clinton, Tennessee. And go up that river a little ways, and you'll see those big eagles flying all over the place. I went up there fishing one time with somebody. And I was out there in the middle of that water and throwing, casting, and fishing a little bit. And I looked up and I thought, my man, look at that wingspan. And it wasn't a vulture. It was an eagle. Yeah. A number of them up there soaring around in the sky. That stuff excites me because Jesus made that eagle. Yeah. Amen. Amen. I don't need any stimulus. I don't need somebody up on a stage pumping my flesh and pouring into me some kind of satanic garbage. I don't need that driving, driving beat that these kids get today in their music and all that. I don't need that. I got something quiet and peaceful in my soul. But it's not about me. It's about him. It's about the rest that he can give you. You rest when you know your sins are forgiven. You rest because you're not carrying that burden anymore. You rest because you know where you're going when you leave this world. There is rest. But there is no rest. If you don't know the Lord, there's no rest. No rest. No rest. I like to lay down 200 yards and squeeze around off. That's boring for a lot of people, but... I like to try to hit the side of a barn door every once in a while. I enjoy that. Ever since I've been in the military, I've always enjoyed shooting a little bit. Boy, I'm a fanatic. They'll come and get me. They'll put me in a straight jacket and handcuffs. You mean that preacher was talking about a gun? Don't you know that a gun is an evil thing? It's not evil if they kick your door down at 2 o'clock in the morning and come and take your wife away. It's not evil if that's the only thing you've got to stop them, amen? Don't let this bunch of fools brainwash you. Don't let them brainwash you. There's nothing intrinsically evil about a weapon. Nothing. It's an evil man that would stop you from defending yourself and your family. That's evil. That's evil. So the Bible says over here that Jesus gave them rest. Of course, the Jesus here is Joshua. And Joshua was such a great type of the Lord, they called him Jesus. That typology, that's a wonderful study, you know. You get in the Old Testament books and find all these people that are types of people in the New Testament. You find these places that are types of things in the New Testament and types of things in heaven. Look at Hebrews chapter number 5 and verse 8. Hebrews 5, 8. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. Now, here's the way most people preach that, that he became obedient by what he suffered. He doesn't say he became obedient. He said he learned obedience. There's a vast difference between the two. So what do you mean, preacher? The Lord Jesus was never disobedient. He was ever obedient to the Father. But there had to be places in life that he had to go into to experience what it would cost him how he would hurt, the price he would pay to remain obedient. That's what that text is talking about. He learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Now, some folks are shouting glory to God when they're on the mountain. Things are going okay. Got income, food on the table. Everything's okay. Good God. He's a good God. My family's here. All my kids are healthy. Everything's going fine. He's a good God. But one thing happened. And it's not hunky-dory anymore, you know. And you're ready then to turn to God and shake the fist. Say, when did you leave me? Why did you forsake me? He said, you'd never forsake me. He said he'd never forsake us. He'd never leave us, didn't he? He said, I will never, ever, 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 ever leave thee. Well, what about when it's going bad, preacher? He's still there. He knows what I need. And he doesn't always come along and tell me what I need and what I'm going to, supposed to do when I go through it. But he knows what I need. He learned obedience. Have some of you learned obedience yet? Or haven't you? That's a simple question. Have you learned that it is much better to serve the Lord than it is to serve yourself? 
Have you learned that it's far, far better to live for God than it is to live for this world? Have you learned to live for eternity and not temporal? Have you really learned that yet? Have you learned to live with each other? Have you learned to bear one another's burdens? Have you learned to put up with a lot of junk from each other? Knowing there was a time when you were full of junk. And the truth of the matter is that you may still have a whole lot of junk around. But for the sake of fellowship, the sake of a higher calling, the sake of a greater purpose, for the sake of the power of the Holy Spirit in the body of Christ, you want to get along with your brothers and your sisters. Have you learned obedience by the things which you suffered? Have you ever suffered? There's some fellow on television advertising, ever, advertising uh, beds. How many's got a water bed? Nobody got a water bed? Some of them still got water beds. Hope it's on a good floor. <laughs> Nothing against water beds. <laughs> but things come and things go. This man is on television advertising a bed. And here's what he says. I've never had a pain in my life. And he looks like he's in his 20s. I thought to myself, <laughs> sail on. <laughs> Sleep on, son. <laughs> oh, you haven't, have you? <laughs> You will. <laughs> How many agree with that? Amen. You will. <laughs> You'll have a pain. <laughs> you may have a big pain. <laughs> you have more than one pain. You may have all kinds of pains, both physical and emotional and spiritual. Amen. No, by the grace of God, he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Therefore, at the right hand of the Father, there's nothing that I'll ever go through that his obedience won't minister the grace of God to me. Which brings us to the next one. In the book of Hebrews, chapter number 6, and verse number 6, it says, If they shall fall away to renew them again to repentance, seeing they crucified of themselves the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. The Greek word fall away is parapipto, and it means to apostatize. What's an apostate? Well, there's some people on the national stage right now singing who used to be Christians, quote unquote, and not anymore. Some of them say they're atheists, agnostics, what have you. There's only one, just one, that knows the human heart. And I don't know my heart. I don't know it. I don't know the depths of it. I don't know what's in there. As, I, as I've said and taught so many times before, i got a monster living in me. Where do you get that from, preacher? Romans chapter number 7. When I would do good, bad things are with me always. What's it say? Evil. Kakos. Evil. Evil. Like an evil heart of unbelief. There is an evil monster. And I can't get away from him. I can smile and take a bath, smell good come to church and put on all the Christian cliches and it doesn't change a thing. When I walk out that door right there, that monster's still with me. That monster will be with me tonight. That monster will wake up me in the morning. What do you do with that monster, preacher? I can't do a thing with him, but Christ can. He can. I turn away from his power, remind him I don't belong to him anymore. I'm not what that I used to be. I've changed by the grace of God. I got one living inside me and that's not who I am. Satan has no claim upon me. I don't belong to him anymore. I've been washed in the blood. Every day if you wake up at first thing in the morning, maybe you need to remind the devil and remind your old nature. I'm not that anymore. I've changed and I've changed from a power greater than I am inside me. And sometimes that monster will back off. He'll never leave you. He'll back off. And you can bring him into subjection. That's the way life goes, folks. That's the real world. Now, if, the, if you know a bunch of Christians who don't have any problem with sin, uh, I, uh, I don't know what they are. They must be from, where, are they, where do you think they're from, brother? What, what's that? Somebody doesn't have any problem with sin. Because I do. It dogs me. It hounds me. It wants to dominate me. 
It wants to affect my thinking. Well, how do you handle it, preacher? The blood of Christ. So I, I fight the fight. The war rages. There's no giving in. There's no quitting. In this, this race that we're running, folks, we're going to run it to the end. And we're going to fight the good fight of faith and lay hold of eternal life. That's what the Bible says. And make no provision for the flesh. That's what the scripture says. But if I fell away, parapipto, if I should fall away, if I should apostatize, if I should renounce Christ, if I should say, I've never, I, don't, I don't know him, I don't have use for him, warning, don't ever call me a Christian again. The Bible says that uh, it's impossible to renew them again to repentance. That's pretty bad, isn't it? So that's a warning for you. Don't matter how bad it gets. Don't ever matter, don't matter how bad it gets. Always remember, he'll go with you through and into the furnace. It's wonderful to, to be in a place you don't choose and be bound when you're cast in there and then watch your bindings burn up. They didn't burn up until they were in the fire and the fourth man was with them. Burn up. Have you ever gone through anything in your life and when you came through the other side you realized some stuff had been burned up? Then you're learning obedience. And then finally I'll close with this one. Hebrews chapter number 6. And I love this. Verse 13. For when God made promise to Abraham because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so after he'd patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife, wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, just underline that, impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, whether the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made in high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now here's what I want you to notice about this. Of all the people in the Old Testament and the way they were saved, Abraham was saved just like you are. Just exactly like you are. He was saved by believing God. Look into the heavens, he said in Genesis 15. What do you see, Abraham? Stars, 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 stars. So shall thy seed be. It'll be as the stars of the heavens and the sand on the seashore. The Bible said Abraham believed God and was accounted to him, imputed to him for righteousness. Grace God ministered to Abraham. Now watch this. When God ministered grace to Abraham, he swore an oath. God did. And here's the way it works. In the Old Testament, when he had Sinai, he brought them under the covenant of the law at Sinai. All that God hath said we will do. So he took them into the land and one group he put on Gerizim, the other one he put on Ebal. Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim, they read the law. Mount Gerizim blessed them. Mount Ebal cursed them. He read the blessings, he read the cursings. Heaven, we'll do it. But they didn't do it. They couldn't do it. And they were brought to the point of utter desperation. And here's what God said about that law. This is important. Please follow me on this. Hebrews 8, 13. In that he saith, a new covenant he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. It's obsolete. It's worn out. It's gone. It's gone because it failed. Therefore, the covenant that God made with man, not himself, 
He made that covenant with man. Man on his side broke the covenant and it came to naught. How many agree with that? They broke it. They couldn't keep it. Couldn't keep it. Broke it. But God made a covenant not with man, but with himself that he would minister grace to man. Man cannot break that covenant. He can't break it. He didn't put it into the hands of men. That's a gracious God. That covenant he swore by his own name. And he used Abraham as a type of it. Because God made a covenant with Abraham. There's an unconditional covenant. And that covenant was, Abraham, you're mine. You're saved. You're going to be saved. And I'm going to do what I intend to do with you. You're going to fail along the way, but I'm still going to do what I intend to do with you. When God saved you, he saved you by grace. He keeps you by grace. He justifies you by grace. He presents you holy and unblameable in his presence by grace. The grace of God that bringeth salvation appeared to all men. The grace of God is what's going to save you, keep you, and carry you in his presence. And that covenant was not made with men. It was made with God himself. Hallelujah. What higher covenant can you have than that? Swore by his own name bound himself that I will save by grace. Have men broken the covenant of grace? Certainly they have. Have they failed? Certainly they have. But it's not conditioned on men. It's conditioned on God. And so the apostle in Hebrews says, by two immutable things. The word immutable simply means unchangeable. It is impossible for God to lie. What's that mean to me practically? For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Not if Johnny or Charles or Jimmy or Susan or Jackie or Katie. No, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's grace. An invitation like that is gracious. Would you do that this morning? His covenant's not with you and it's not with man. It's with himself. And that's good. Because I don't trust man, I don't trust me, but I trust him. Amen. Father, in thy name we pray. <laughs> that you'd use what I've said for the glory of God. I've delivered my soul. Folk, Lord, there are folks in this house right now. They need help. I need help. And Father, no doubt I need help in ways that I'm not even conscious of. Don't even know, I don't have a clue about right now, but I do need help. I need thee, Lord. I need thee. Oh, how I need thee. Blessed Lamb of God. In Jesus' name we pray. For Jesus' sake we ask it. Amen. Let's stand up.